Okay, so it seems like we've hit a, a plateau um, for this webinar series. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, to the Resident and Fellows Education Committee for the Society of Surgery for the Elementary Tract. Um, this will be the first part in a two-part webinar series um, over uh, overviewing some high yield topics for the app site, which always seems to sneak up every year uh, much quicker than people anticipate. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we um, This webinar will also be recorded. So obviously there's a lot of content in each of these subjects that our wonderful presenters will not necessarily be able to go through everything in detail, but both the slides and also this the recording for this webinar will be available on the SSAT website um, after the webinar. So I just want to reassure everyone of that. And then, so without further ado, I don't want to take any time away from our presenters. We'll go on to our first um, topic. Today, we are planning to uh, overview, cover a lot. We're going to overview esophagus, stomach, and mys and foregut um, with Dr. Shavi Rahani, um, for a surgery resident from Louisiana State University. And without further ado, Shavi, take it away. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can take it away. There you go. Thank you. All right, give me one second. I'm going to share my screen. All right. All right, so today we'll be talking about foregut and bariatric surgery. Uh, like Rachel mentioned, unfortunately, there's just too much to cover. So we will not be getting to the neoplasms and the masses and the management thereof today. Um, but I'll try to get to some of more of the bread and butter stuff, uh, and hopefully y'all have time to review the rest on your own. So we'll start with esophagus, just going, you know, top down. As always, anatomy first. Um, important thing to remember about the esophagus is that it does not have a serosal layer. So we're going to start, you know, on the inside, we have the mucosa, followed by the submucosa, where our lymphatics are. And then you have your muscularis propria made up of your two layers, the inner circular muscle layer and the outer longitudinal muscle layer. And then you have your adventitia. Uh, something important to remember, like we, we said, the submucosa is where our lymphatics are. So when you do have neoplasm and you're considering that, considering your staging, if they've gotten to that point, you really want to start thinking about, you know, your spread is going to be lymphatic and that is going to change your management if the tumor hasn't made it that far. The other reason I like this image is because you can kind of see the right and the left uh, vagus nerves and you can kind of see how they're going to make that 90 degree clockwise rotation as they move anteriorly and posteriorly. On the right, you can see in this image um, some questions that I've seen a couple of times um, are questions about areas of physio physiologic narrowing of the esophagus. So obviously you're gonna have narrowing, you know, at your upper and your lower esophageal sphincters. Um, but you also wanna remember, you know, right by your manubrium, you're gonna have a sh short area of narrowing there physiologically. And you're also gonna have narrowing kind of where the esophagus passes by um, your bronchus and your aorta. Next, we're going to talk about esophageal motility disorders. Very common thing you'll see in clinic people coming in with dysphagia, globus sensation, things like that. Um, I personally have not seen them give, you know, like the manometry um, uh, images on the exam, but they'll kind of describe what you would find on manometry. So for esophageal spasms, you'll see, you know, some strong non-peristaltic unorganized contractions. Your LES will still relax appropriately. And for that, you know, the diagnosis is going to be esophageal spasms. And you treat that mostly medically. You're going to treat it with nitrates or your calcium channel blockers. You can also see nutcracker esophagus. Uh, this was something that kind of confused me when I was an intern, you know, the difference between esophageal spasms and nutcracker esophagus. But the manometry findings are different. So you're going to see high amplitude, and those contractions are going to be peristaltic. They're not going to be as unorganized. Uh, and like with esophageal spasms, you are still going to see that LES relaxation. Treatment for this, again, is mostly medical management. You're going to have nitrates. You're going to have your calcium channel blockers. You can also try endoscopic Botox injection. And lastly, we're going to talk about achalasia, um, that classic, you know, bird's beak on uh, barium swallow. 
Uh, for that, the manometry findings will be, you're not really gonna see peristaltic contract contractions. Um, you're gonna see incomplete LES relaxation and they'll talk about you know increased LES pressure. And that's kind of what gives you the achalasia. It's uh, most commonly a destruction of those nerve cells. Um, and you can kind of see that in autoimmune disorders or maybe even infectious, if you remember kind of from med school Chagas disease. Treatment for that, you can do balloon dilation. I haven't seen POEM as commonly on the app side as an answer, but it is something that you know we can use to treat achalasia. And more commonly on the app side, you'll see um, a heller myotomy as your option for surgical management of achalasia. For the heller myotomy, how to do it, um, so in this image, you're going to kind of see your GE junction. This image is a little bit misleading, um, and I put it over here. So you want to go about six centimeters above the GE junction onto the esophagus, but you also need to come down about, you know, two centimeters onto the stomach itself in order to have a complete myotomy. And you're going to go through both layers, that inner circular layer and that outer longitudinal layer that we talked about to actually have a complete myotomy. You should be able to see your mu mucosa protruding. Uh, and obviously there should be no holes in your mucosa. Uh, commonly with that, you'll see people do either a toupee or a door fund application. Um, and a lot of that, you know, kind of ends up being certain preference. Some people will prefer a door fund application because they feel like it really buttresses their repair. Other people think they get better functional outcomes with a toupee. Um, either way, those are common options. Um, you're not going to see a Nissen. A Nissen would be incorrect um, for this. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the different wraps and why we would do them a little bit later. Another common thing to think about for, uh, you know, when we're thinking about heller myotomy, um, esophageal perforations. Um, so let's say that you, you know, have done a heller myotomy for achalasia. The patient's doing okay post-op. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden they have, you know, a pneumothorax and you have concern for this, um, you know, esophageal perforation, that should kind of concern you that maybe you didn't get through all of your layers of muscle, there's more work to be done. Um, and so when you're thinking about perforations, you want to think about the cause for that, you'd have to go back in and do a complete myotomy um, on the other side, and make sure you're taking care of that, not just treating the perforation. Moving on, we're gonna talk about gastroesophageal reflux disease, super common topic. Um, obviously, due to increased acid exposure to the esophagus, most commonly, you know, we'll start with lifestyle changes, you know, stopping smoking, decreasing alcohol use, things like that. And your mainstay of management is gonna be your PPI. Things that will, you know, kind of concern you and say, maybe these are some warning symptoms. We need to work this up more than just, you know, it's acid reflux is if the patient has been on a PPI for a while, haven't really improved, if they are having more dysphagia, if they're having unintentional weight loss, or if they're having anemia and bleeding. And for that, you would do an EGD. Um, on the right, and this very top image is an example of Barrett's esophagus of what you might see. And you can kind of see um, that there is a stark difference between the squamous and the columnar epithelium that you're seeing with the Barrett's. The definition of Barrett's is going to be metaplasia and changes on biopsy um, from the normal esophageal mucosa. Uh, something else that I find really helpful and something you, know, you see a lot clinically is a Los Angeles classification of reflux esophagitis, being able to define, you know, the degree of esophagitis that you're seeing. So grade A is going to be one or more mucosal breaks that are, you know, less than five millimeters. They don't extend between the tops of the mucosal folds. Um, and then obviously increasing in severity all the way up to grade B, where, you know, it's more than 75% of the circumference. Um, and just knowing this classification can be helpful in figuring out, you know, how aggressive you're going to be with treatment, how aggressive you're going to be with management. As far as GERD is concerned, we're going to think about, you know, our surgical considerations. Why would we want to do surgery instead of just continuing with the PPI? Sometimes people fail PPI management. Sometimes they just don't want to be on PPI therapy for their entire life. And, you know, if they're an overall good surgical candidate, I think it makes sense to go ahead and proceed with surgery for their gastroesophageal reflux disease. 
Preoperatively, though, we want to make sure that we're working everything up. So the mainstays of surgery for our um, GERD is going to be, you know, either a toupee or a Nissen fund application. But we don't want to do a full Nissen wrap, which is a 360 degree wrap, as you can kind of see in this picture, if the person already has esophageal motility problems, because that can make their esophageal motility problems worse. So our pre-op workup is going to include manometry. We want to look at, you know, make sure they don't have any motility issues. We're going to do a barium swallow, make sure there's no um, concurrent hiatal hernias that may need repair at the time of the procedure. Um, we'll also need to do an EGD prior to any repairs because you want to rule out any mucosal lesions. Um, you're going to get biopsies and make sure that there's no, you know, H. pylori that may be contributing to their symptoms. And then you can do pH monitoring as well. Um, there's a couple of different ways. I think the most common thing that I've seen is the Demeester score. Um, and it's a weirdly specific number, the 14.72, um, but a Demeester score higher than that correlates to, um, is positive for presence of gastroesophageal reflux disease. The Demeester score, I've never been asked to calculate it on the app site, but things to know, you know, things it's looking at is the time that you've spent on acid exposure above a certain acid level, um, the number of gastroesophageal reflux episodes and things like that. All of those go into calculating that score. And then in this image, you know, again, we're just kind of seeing the Nissen fund application here. So the Nissen is a 360 degree wrap. Alternatively, if you were worried or if you didn't want to do the 360 degree wrap or there was even some concern for any motility problems, you would do a toupee fund application, which is just a 270 degree wrap. So not all the way around. Uh, common complications that you might think of, um, you know, with this procedure is that these patients are going to have some degree of dysphagia post-op. That is normal. But if they have persistent dysphagia, maybe, you know, four to six weeks out, things aren't getting better, they're getting worse, you would want to go ahead and try to do an EGD, work that up further, um, make sure they don't need balloon dilation or anything like that. Because at that point, you know, it's a technical error or something else is happening and you have to go evaluate that. Next, we're going to talk about hiatal hernias. So anytime that you're doing surgery for gastroesophageal reflux disease, your main objective is going to be to try to get that GE junction back into the abdomen and then wrap it around. A lot of times what you can see sometimes is that these patients may have concomitant hiatal hernias. And when that happens during the procedure, you have to make sure that you're reducing that, getting the GE junction back into the abdomen, in addition to about at least two to three centimeters of that esophagus intra-abdominal to really make sure that, you know, when you swallow, um, that esophagus tends to try to go up and it has room to do that and act physiologically. So here you can see kind of normal esophagus and stomach in a type one hernia, this is a sliding hernia, uh, where the GE junction is actually in the mediastinum and not below the at or below the diaphragm. For type one hernias, if they're not symptomatic, they don't require repair, but sometimes these patients can have you know, reflux disease and that would be an indication to repair it. Type two, what they, you know, sometimes people, some people will call this a rolling hiatal hernia. Some people will call this a parasophageal. Um, but you can see that the GE junction is still in place, but a little bit of the stomach is in the mediastinum. A type three is where the GE junction is also in the mediastinum in, in addition to the stomach. And then a type four is not shown here, um, but that would be if there were any other organs in addition to the stomach that were herniated through the diaphragm. That can be colon, that can be omentum, sometimes uh, pancreas even, which is weird, um, but it can happen. Um, and anytime you're doing any of these procedures, you have to reduce all of those contents back into the abdomen as part of your repair. Now, most commonly, like we said, uh, you want to get at least, you know, two to three centimeters of that esophagus into the stomach. If you do a high enough mediastinal di uh, dissection, you should be able to do that no problem. If you have issues doing that, you can theoretically do a collis gastroplasty. Um, I have not seen that personally on the app site, but 
If it comes up, the answer would be to do cause gastroplasty. Like I said, if you have to go into the mediastinum, there's always going to be a possibility of, you know, entering that pleural space and causing a capnothorax, which is, you know, the CO2. Um, if that were to happen, most commonly that happens, you know, during your mediastinal dissection, you might hear anesthesia talk about, you know, oh, we're having higher end tidal CO2s. How we would treat that is if there is, you know, a tear in that pleura that you've identified, the first thing you want to do is kind of make that tear a little bit bigger because what we want to avoid is a tension capnothorax. You know, if the hole is really small, that CO2 that you're inflating with can kind of, you know, lead to basically a tension pneumo. Um, and we want to avoid that. So make that hole slightly larger. And you want to try to equalize the pressures between the mediastinum and the abdomen. Uh, and that is the goal of that. Uh, sometimes postoperatively, um, you know, you might see the patient in post-op, let's say you get a chest x-ray and they have a small pneumothorax in the chest x-ray, most likely capnothorax, you can give them oxygen. It should resorb very quickly. You know, we use CO2 during inflation. Um, but if it's, you know, really large or they're having shortness of breath, they might require, you know, a pigtail catheter or decompression in that way. It's just something to remember um, for a common complication you might see. Next, we're going to talk about peptic ulcer disease, also a very commonly tested topic. Um, every year, this is one of those things I have to study, um, like the three days leading up to abscite, the different types. Um, so type one ulcers um, are in the gastric body along the lesser curvature. So you can kind of see uh, that in figure B. So you have on the gastric body lesser curve, um, type two is going to be in the body of the stomach and the duodenal ulcer. That one is easy for me to remember because it's type two and there are two different types of ulcers, gastric and duodenal. Type three is going to be prepyloric and type four is going to be high on the lesser curvature. Uh, something that you know they will commonly test on. So type two and type three are going to be the types of ulcers that are associated with high acid output. And type one and type four are going to be associated with decreased mucosal protection. Um, I don't know why they love testing that part, but they do. Uh, and then type five, it can be anywhere, but it's medication induced. So that's going to be like your NSAIDs uh, and things like that. Something else to remember with peptic ulcer disease is the association with H. pylori. So H. pylori is actually associated with 75% of gastric ulcers. Um, and something like 90% of duodenal ulcers. Treatment is going to be, you know, triple therapy, your PPI, your clarithromycin, your amoxicillin, or your flagell. Um, and then you can also have stressed gastric ulcers. This is another thing I think that comes up on the app site a lot. Um, so stressed gastric ulcers can be due to a lot of things. Most commonly what you're going to hear is coagulopathy, or prolonged ventilation. So that's why in, you know, the ICU, you, when you have those kinds of patients, you're going to be giving them, you know, a prophylactic PPI because you know, they're going to be prone to those stress ulcers. Um, other causes include traumatic brain injuries, like head trauma patients uh, and patients with burns. And those are going to be your, you know, curling, or curling ulcers. Anytime that you have a gastric ulcer and you're doing an EGD for it, always gastric ulcers have a higher risk of malignancy than duodenal ulcers. So you always want to biopsy those. Oh, yeah. um, and then as far as, you know, when these ulcers bleed, because like you can see in this kind of table, bleeding is a very common complication of them. Um, the first line of management is always going to be endoscopic if you can. You can do clips, you can do, um, you know, uh, epinephrine injection, ablation, things like that. Um, and the, that will be always be your first line of management. If they, you know, do well the first time with endoscopic management and bleed again, second step is to go right back to the um, endos endoscopic suite. And then we're going to move on to our bariatrics. Um, so lap bands, not super common procedures that I see very often now, but um, it's definitely something you'll see in clinic to manage, uh, you know, some post-op complications from. 
So lap bands used to be very common. They'll give you an excess weight loss of about 50%. Um, they're pretty popular or they were pretty popular because um, they don't have a lot of morbidity and mortality initially. You know, all you're doing is putting a little, um, essentially a restrictive clamp around the stomach. You're not, you know, taking any of your stomach out and most patients are going to feel you know, pretty comfortable with that. They come attached with this port uh, and the port is, you know, under your skin and you can add saline, take away saline that increases or decreases the amount of restriction that you're having from the band. However, the band has its own set of complications. Um, there can be erosion. So depending on how long the band has been in place, sometimes that band will start eroding into the stomach uh, and that can manifest as, you know, just abdominal pain. More commonly, you're going to see maybe some port site infections or erythema of the port itself. And that should kind of lead you to think like, okay, something more is going on. And that's why the port is infected because the band is eroding into the stomach. Something less commonly seen, um, but definitely still possible is slippage of the band. Um, so here you can kind of see that it's going to kind of place at an angle about like a 45 degree angle. Sometimes I can slip down um, and the patient will present with, you know, intolerance to food, they can have reflux. Uh, and the way to diagnose that if the patient has a band is to take an x-ray and you can kind of see the angle at which the lap band has been implanted. You want that angle to be less than maybe like 50 to 60 degrees. If you're seeing, you know, a 90 degree angle, that band is not in place and needs to be taken out. Next, we're going to talk about sleeve gastrectomy. This is by far the most common procedure that is done. Um, most patients feel really comfortable with it because, you know, it's just their stomach. There's no intestinal manipulation. So they feel like it's not as big uh, of a surgery. Um, excess weight loss that can be expected is 50 to 60% of their excess weight. Um, however, again, it has its own set of complications. You can always have a leak uh, as with any surgery where you're using staples to go across a uh, hollow organ. Uh, that will most commonly present with tachycardia as its first symptom. Um, and then you can have post-op reflux. Because if you think about kind of your anatomy, now you have just a straight tube, you know, and there's no uh, reservoir like you have with a normal stomach to kind of prevent any of that reflux going right up your esophagus. If these patients with a sleeve develop um, esophagitis or a reflux, then surgically, you would convert them to a ruin Y to improve that. Um, conversely, you know, kind of thinking on the preoperative end, that's one of the questions that's really important to ask the patient before you offer them surgery, because if the patient has uh, acid reflux preoperatively, this procedure would make it worse. So they may not be the best candidate for a sleeve, and they may be a better candidate for ruin Y gastric bypass. And lastly, we're going to talk about a ruin Y gastric bypass. So it's probably the second most common procedure that we do. Um, the excess weight loss that we can expect is about 75 to 80%. So definitely more than any of the other treatments, but of course it's definitely a more involved procedure. Um, lots of people like it because it can really help a lot of their comorbidities, their diabetes, something like 80% of patients um, will have resolution of their diabetes and they won't require insulin one year, which is amazing. Um, but of course it comes with its own set of complications. So you can have dumping syndrome early and late. Um, and those are kind of defined by the reason that you're having, you know, this hyperosmotic load. Um, you can have an internal hernia. And anytime that in question send that you hear that someone has had gastric bypass surgery, you want to have, you know, a lower threshold for making sure that an internal hernia is in your differential for any kind of abdominal pain. Um, marginal ulcers. These patients need to avoid ibuprofen, Tordol, any of those NSAIDs uh, for the rest of their life. Um, they're going to be very, very prone to getting those and they that would require further treatment, obviously. You can always have a leak. Uh, something commonly to think of is nutritional deficiencies. And I feel like the app site likes to test this very commonly. These are again, something that I have to review every time before the app site, like three days before the app site. Uh, but a common nutritional deficiency you can see is, you know, B12, zinc, calcium. 
Um, so commonly, you'll, you know, if you see these patients in the ED for anything, one of your go-to things should just be, you know, hang a banana bag, make sure you give them Foley, make sure you give them thiamine. Um, and it's just part of, and, any, and get all the, you know, nutrition labs going to be very pro to that. And the last thing, you know, afferent limb syndrome. Um, so the afferent limb is going to be your, you know, your BP limb. Um, and sometimes that can, if there's a distal obstruction, you can have uh, bacterial overgrowth from that. Um, I did not include um, the duodenal switch or the SADI in this presentation. I do not expect them to necessarily be on the app site this year. Um, they are other forms of bariatric surgery. They're definitely gaining popularity though. Um, it might be something that you wanna look up on your own. I'm not expecting to be on the app site this year, but maybe next year. Um, I think we have a little bit of time. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. <laughs> yes, thanks, uh, Shabi. That's a great presentation. If anyone, we do have a couple minutes for any questions. If any of the audience members wants to put it in the Q&A. Um, Okay, and then with that, then um, if anyone does have any questions um, uh, at the end or after another presentation, feel free to put in the, the Q&A section and we can also go back and answer them um, at a later time as well. Okay, so thank you very much for that great presentation, Shavi. So next we'll um, hop right into um, hepatopancreatobiliary or HPB. Um, this will uh, this review will be given by a Dr. Huda Mohammed, a surgical resident from Stanford University. So thanks for taking the time to be with us and take it away. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Um, so yes, I'm Huda. Um, I am a fifth year at Stanford, and so this. Uh, the presentation has a lot of slides um, and a lot of information on it. I won't go through every single thing, but um, I'm hoping that you, you will be able to refer to it later for all the things that I'm not able to go through specifically. So first we're gonna start with liver and liver anatomy. You know, this is our basic view of the liver. You have um, your, your right lobe, your left lobe, your um, falciform ligament, and then here posteriorly, um, uh, you can see the porter hepatitis, the gallbladder, um, and the different uh, you know, lobes from behind. The caudate lobe tends to be around, well, is around the IBC. And then there are these uh, uh, hepatic veins, the middle left and right. And then you also have uh, paired short hepatic veins that come off the IBC into the liver um, as well. And so I found liver anatomy super confusing when I um, was starting to learn it. But uh, essentially you have eight functional segments with uh, each with its own portal triad, right? And so I always think of the portal triad as a little Mickey Mouse. Um, the portal vein is the big, you know, Mickey Mouse head. The CBD is generally um, lateral and then the hepatic artery medial. And so each segment has its own portal triad. And then of course you have the hepatic veins, which are the drainage. So this is your inflow and this is your outflow. The liver then is divided into three vertical planes where the hepatic veins are, right? And so everything um, to the right of the right hepatic vein um, are segments uh, six and seven. Between the, the right and middle hepatic veins are five and eight. Between the middle and the left hepatic vein are four B and four A and four B. And then lateral to the left hepatic vein are two and three. Caudate is, like I said, around the IVC and tends to be a little posterior, right? And then the way you can uh, kind of divide them superior and lateral, uh, superior and inferior is the portal vein itself um, comes kind of in between here. So you have your three vertical planes and then your horizontal plane. Um, Cantley's line is on the line of the middle hepatic vein, and that is what uh, uh, splits your liver into the right and the left, right? Um, when you have, when you further uh, divide up your right lobe, you have your anterior sector, 
because your portal vein breaks up into the anterior portal vein and then the left anterior portal vein on the right side. So the anterior sector is five and eight. The posterior sector is six and seven. And then on the left side, each segment has its own portal vein uh, uh, branch. And so you have your medial segment, which is um, 4A and 4B, and your lateral segment, 2 and 3. Um, kind of more grossly, you have your um, ligaments, your coronary ligaments, your right and left triangle ligaments, and your uh, falciform. And then your round ligament uh, is what is the uh, obliterated um, umbilical vein. And so when we're saying we're mobilizing the liver, we're taking down these attachments so we are able to move the liver more freely. I This website is like one of my favorite websites to learn this because it, it helps uh, you kind of correlate these like cartoon pictures with actual CT scans. And so I would highly recommend this uh, website to look at CT scans and trying to figure out which segment is where. And they have great pearls. Like for example, when you look at the right hepatic vein, if it's not coming at essentially a 90 degree angle, if it's coming out more oblique or acute, that means there's been some hypertrophy or atrophy of the right hepatic lobe, things like that. So on your own time, I would um, definitely look this one. So then when you're looking at your liver resections, we, you know, we break them up um, into, of course, your right and left hepatectomies, right, five, six, seven, eight, your right, um, left hepatectomy is two, three, and four. And then your extended hepatectomies basically include your middle hepatic vein, right? So you'll include segment four on either the right side or the left side. Um, so one thing you have to consider for future liver, uh, for liver resections is going to be your future liver remnant is the volume of liver remaining after your resection. So for a normal person or a healthy person without a cirrhotic liver, you can take, you know, 70, 80% of their liver and they're totally fine. With patients with uh, fibrosis or, for example, colon cancer patients who have hepatic injury, you need a little bit more. You need about 30% of the of, of an FLR. For patients with frank cirrhosis or chronic biliary obstruction, uh, chronic uh, cholangitis, you need even more, 40% of their liver remaining. So if you need to grow some liver, you, what you can do is embolize the portal vein. You embolize the right or the left portal vein, which allows the contralateral side to hypertrophy so you can have enough um, uh, FLR remaining. So this is a picture where the right uh, portal vein has been embolized, right? You don't see any blood flow here and all of this growth of the, of the left, um, uh, left side of the liver. Um, so we have portal hypertension here uh, and cirrhosis. Um, so, you know, there are specific definitions for cirrhosis and essentially, you know, one of the ways we diagnose it, we put in a catheter down from the um, IVC, we wedge it in the liver and we find what this wedge pressure is, not unlike doing a swan for pulmonary wedge pressures. And uh, a gradient greater than six millimeters of mercury is what establishes cirrhosis. You have, you know, different classifications, pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post-sinusoidal, with some examples here. Um, this will lead to varices, right, the portal hypertension, the increased pressure, right, so that leads to gastric esophageal varices when you, when you have the portal hypertension in the umbilicus, caput medusae, rectum you get hemorrhoids, and then you have scores that look at your degree of cirrhosis, your MELD, which is very um, objective, and the child PU, which has some more subjective things, how bad their ascites is, how bad their encephalopathy. There are various you know, medical ways of treating liver um, uh, cirrhosis before you get to surgery, right? You'll get questions about somebody coming in with a massive GI bleed from esophageal varices. You activate your NTP. You can, if you know, are not able to get endoscopy, um, you know, right away and they're like dying, you can use Blakemore and Minnesota balloons to occlude these varices in both the esophagus and the stomach. You start PPI drips and then endoscopically you do variceal banding. For encephalopathy, you treat those with rifaximin and lactulose to decrease those, that uh, bacterial load that's causing the ammonia uh, and uh, causing the encephalopathy. And then, you know, if uh, if these things are not working or they are, these patients are having problems, you can do a TIPS procedure to then try to decrease um, the tension.
moving on to infectious liver diseases. So we're going to first start with the abscesses. So this is a pyogenic abscess. Um, you know, historically, these are the abscesses people got from untreated uh, appendicitis or untreated diverticulitis. You know, some bacterial load is too much for the liver to clear, and then you get an abscess. Uh, so it's most likely the right liver. Most of them are solitary, and they tend to be polymicrobial GNRs. E. coli and Klebsiella are the most common. And then, as you might imagine, fever, sometimes jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. Um, on CT scan, the abscess wall enhances, and after uh, you treat them with antibiotics, and if they're big enough, IR drainage. For amoebic liver abscesses, um, you know, you find them in tropical and developing countries, and it's caused by Entamoeba histolytica. Interestingly enough, it's much more male predominance than female predominance. Humans are the principal hosts and the main source of infection. Some buzzwords you might hear are this acellular proteinaceous debris in the questions, or you'll hear something like this anchovy sauce in the abscess. That is what's pictured here. It's like the amoebic trophozoids plus like blood and this debris. And so when you see these bud words, I would think amoebic um, liver abscess. To diagnose it, you need serology. You need the uh, anti-amoebic antibodies. And the way you treat them are with metronidazole or flagell and drainage if it's a large abscess. Lastly, uh, or not lastly, you have a kind of cockle cyst um, from the E granulosis most commonly, or E multilocularis or E ligartis, right? And the buzzword here are the cysts with daughter cyst. Um, the sometimes they are calcified. That doesn't mean that the cyst is dead, but um, uh, there the calcification leads you to more uh, in a kind of cockle abscess rather than a pyogenic or amoebic abscess. Um, Again, mostly in the right liver. If they rupture, you can get disseminated a kind of caucus or basically anaphylaxis. And you treat these with albendazole or mebendazole. And if sometimes if you're not, uh, if the patient is um, a poor surgical candidate for actually removal of the abscess, you do this puncture, aspiration, injection, re-aspiration, pair therapy um, to try to treat these. It is hard for, to get them to totally resolve. Um, and then we have recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. You have repeated attacks of cholangitis secondary to biliary stones that you create in your liver and in your, uh, in your bile ducts, not from your gallbladder. This is almost exclusively in pa uh, patients of Asian uh, descent, uh, and you get stones and structures. For some reason, they mostly affect the left hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct system. And if you have it long enough, patients can get cirrhosis and liver failure. They have an increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma. And so you can treat them non-operatively with like lithotripsy, but it doesn't really work. And so sometimes you have to do surgery to clear the biliary tree, um, you know, open up the strictures or even do an HJ with a CBD exploration. So that's the infectious diseases. Now the liver neoplasms. So this used to be super confusing to me. And so, um, you know, looking at the different ways to identify these liver neoplasms from the buzzwords that they caught, um, that the questions will ask. So the first one is hemangioma. It's the most common benign tumor, and it's definitely more women than men. There's a special entity that, um, if they bring up, is an indication for surgery, which is the Casback Merritt syndrome, Th thrombocytopenia, and a consumptive coagulopathy, right? And so the buzzwords you will hear are peripheral central enhancement, centrifugal, centrifugal enhancement, or peripheral nodular enhancement. It's abnormal blood vessels. And so if you can imagine um, in the different phases, arterial portal venous and delayed, it starts with these like basically puddles of contrast, which then over the later phases slowly fill in and become almost uh, isotense as the liver itself. So those are the buzzwords for hemangioma. Next is a focal nodular hyperplasia or like the central scar, right? So you'll hear the central fibrous scar with the radiate, radiating septa. On histology, it's actually cords of benign hepatocytes and bile ducts. It's the only tumor that also includes bile ducts. So you'll hear those buzzwords. And so you'll have rapid arterial enhancement with the, um, the hypo to iso intense uh, on the portal venous phase. Also, what is helpful, if you get an MRI with EOVIS, which uh, makes bile ducts light up, it's the only mass that will enhance. All the other masses look like a black hole on MRI with EOVIS. So that's because they're the only mass with bile ducts. So that's what really sets the FNH apart from the other masses. Adenomas, you have young women, they're associated with steroids, um, hormones like uh, birth control and male use of anabolic steroids. Um, more women than men. 
And, you know, oftentimes the treatment is to stop the birth control if you can. Um, and so they have a transient homogenous arterial enhancement, and then they become iso intense on the portal venous and delayed phase. On histology, they're only hepatocytes, no bile ducts, unlike the FNH. And so you have first centripetal enhancement, and then it looks more like more and more like liver. They're associated with beta catenin, um, which is a word that you might see in the question. And then adenomas, when they're greater than five centimeters, they're associated with spontaneous rupture, um, which leads to hemorrhage. So you don't really operate on them or you know uh, even surveil them unless they're bigger than five centimeters. Um, and then you have hepatocellular carcinoma. The buzzword here is is rapid washout. You start it, it, uh, with an arterial enhancement, they're vascular tumors, but then um, on the delayed phases, they're black. You cannot, uh, they're darker than the surrounding liver. And so that's really classic for HCC, which is why you can diagnose them without uh, biopsies. You can diagnose them just with uh, radiology alone, and they use the LIRADS criteria for that. Uh, so there are different ways to treat uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, including uh, the liver-directed uh, therapies like TACE, radio, EMBO. Then you have resection, and then you have transplant. To qualify for a transplant, you get the Milan criteria. So that's one lesion less than five centimeters or up to three lesions, each smaller than three centimeters, no extra hepatic manifestations and no evidence of gross vascular invasion. Then you have cholangial carcinoma. It's rarer. It can develop anywhere along the biliary tree. The most common is the Klatskin, which happens at the confluence of the right and left hepatic ducts. But you can also have intrahepatic uh, cholangial carcinoma and distal hepatic cholangial carcinoma, uh, distal bile duct cholangial carcinoma. Uh, patients who are more at risk are the PSC patients, cholidocal cyst patients, um, and the others here listed. Um, sometimes you have some peripheral enhancement and washout, but it's not nearly as noticeable as um, here with the HCC. And the most common tumors in the liver are actually hepatic metastases. They're typically hypoenhancing. They just look like little black uh, or darker dots compared to the rest of the liver. Okay, moving on to biliary disease. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because I think we, as general surgery consult residents, we get this all the time. But you have your biliary colic, calculus cholecystitis, acalculus cholecystitis, and chronic uh, cholecystitis. The Tokyo guidelines um, are what classifies you from mild to severe cholecystitis. And then on uh, to diagnose them, you can use ultrasounds. You find the you know the the buzzwords pericholecystic fluid, impacted stone, thickened gallbladder wall more than three millimeters. You should look at the CBD to make sure there's no cholidoco. And then if you're not sure if you're, you know, it's the, the findings are equivocal on ultrasound, you can do a height of scan. Important to know that you have to have normal liver function to get a height of scan. Sometimes people with, um, you'll get a consult, people with cirrhosis, and they're like, oh, do they have uh, cholecystitis? Let's get a height of scan. It won't work because you need normal function to secrete the radio tracer. And then uh, your treatments are cholecystectomy, lap or open, and then percutaneous cholecystostomy for patients uh, who are too sick to get uh, uh, surgery. Um, then you have your gallbladder polyps and gallbladder cancer. Um, these pop up a lot, even though they're not really super common, but essentially you only take them out once they're bigger, once they're a centimeter or larger. Um, if they're smaller than that, you can either surveil them or just kind of have a conversation with the patient. Um, after they start getting big, you actually presume malignancy. And then the, on the app site, they ask this question all the time, who gets just the lap coli or versus who gets the extended, like the radical cholecystectomy? And essentially, everyone who is above a T1A gets the extended cholecystectomy. So just remembering that... Um, these patients, the T1A means invades up to the lamina propria versus involves the muscularis. That is the division between the T1A and T1B. And anybody who has involves the muscularis or more gets the extended cholecystectomy. Uh, for gallstones that can cause cholecystitis, cholidoco, and cholangitis, here are some like you may get a question here and there. The Maritzi syndrome is when you have a stone in the duct that is causing external compression on the CBD, and that is what causes um, a CBD obstruction. Um, so you you know you may get a question like, oh, should the community surgeon do this, or should they send the patient to an HPB surgeon? And the the answer is always send the patient to an HPB surgeon because there is the CBD involvement. Gallstone ileus, 
the inflammation from the gallbladder causes a fistula to the duodenum and it allows a large stone out um, into the intestines, which then can cause um, an obstruction. One question that you hear a lot is what do you do first? Do you take out the gallbladder during the, the index emission? Do you just handle the, the obstruction? Do you do everything? The answer is to manage the obstruction first. There's often a lot of inflammation around the gallbladder and the duodenum. And unless people are prepared to do a Whipple, it's not a great idea. So you always manage the obstruction first. Often requires a laparotomy, making an enterotomy in a longitudinal direction, milking out all the stones, and then either resecting or closing the, um, the enterotomy uh, transversely. And then we have gallstone pancreatitis. So you can do a CBD exploration laparoscopically or... Um, or have a preoperative ERCP to clear the stones. Um, biliary dyskinesia is a motility disorder of the gallbladder. It's essentially a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. And so there's all these criteria called the Rome criteria. Essentially, you have to rule out everything, meet these criteria, and then you get a, a cholecystectomy. You diagnose this with a HIDA scan with an ejection fraction um, and an ejection fraction of the uh, gallbladder of you know, between 30 and 35% or less is indicative of biliary dyskinesia. Then we have cholidocal cysts, which are these anomalous uh, pancreatic biliary junction that allows reflux of pancreatic juices that um, causes chronic inflammation. There are four different, excuse me, five different types, and we won't go into the details of all of them, but type one is this kind of fusiform dilation of the of the CBD, and this is the most common and has malignant potential. So the treatment is to resect them and then reconstruct their biliary tree. The others, um, of the others, the only other uh, type that has malignant potential is type four, which is the combined uh, dilation of the intra and extrahepatic biliary tree. So these are often treated with resection. The others can be treated endoscopically or just conservatively. Sometimes for like Crohn's disease um, or even type four, you may have to get a liver transplant because of it's just kind of all in their biliary tree. Okay, moving on to pancreas. Um, so here's some anatomy of the pancreas. You have your different parts of the pancreas. I find that one of the most important landmarks is the neck because that is where the blood vessels are. That's where they, behind the neck is where the SMA and the SMD. Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about pancreatic cancer, these are the things that were um, uh, helping us determine who is resectable and not. Um, there are some kind of embryological issues. You have pancreas divism where the, the ducts do not uh, fuse. Uh, and so these patients can have pancreatitis or annular pancreas where the ventral bud does not rotate. And so you have a pancreas that uh, kind of encircles the duodenum and causes an obstruction. So the treatment with those is a duodenal bypass. For the physiology, knowing what each of like the cell populations do can be helpful in kind of determining some, some things like pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I'll just leave you guys here to, to review this on your own. So for pancreatitis, uh, abnormal pancreatic enzyme activation inside the acinar cells, the digestive cells, um, that leads to edema and acinar cell death and autodigestion. So there are several causes of um, pancreatitis. The most in the West is most common in the West is gallstone pancreatitis. Um, but sometimes you do get questions about genetic predispositions um, like her hereditary pancreatitis. And then so you have these um, manifestations. Um, sometimes you get questions about different signs, the Cohen sign and the Gray Turner sign, um, which are due to um, hemorrhagic, like necrosis sometimes of the pancreas. And so they get these ecchymoses at the belly button and on the flank. So these are just buzzwords to have you think of pancreatitis. And so these, um, so you need these diagnostic criteria to, it's a clinical diagnosis to be able to diagnose um, uh, pancreatitis, and you have your uh, revised Atlanta classification. So you have early and late, mild, moderate, and severe, and edematous and uh, necrotizing. And with each of these time frames, you have fluid collections associated with them. So in the early time, in less than four weeks, you have acute peripancreatic collections or acute necrotic collections. And when they're older, it's either a pseudocyst of walled off necrosis of the dead pancreas. Right. So this is a CT scan of just like run of the mill interstitial edematous pancreatitis. The pancreas looks kind of fluffy. Here's necrotizing pancreatitis. Right. You can only see a little bit of enhancement of the pancreas and then all this hypo enhancing pancreas that is dead. Here is a pseudocyst. It's very simple, you know, fluid collection with pancreas that is alive. 
where this is the walled off pan uh, pancreatic fluid collection. You know, you have some alive pancreas here, but most of this is dead pancreas and it's greater than four weeks. Um, so the treatment, fluid resuscitation, fluid resuscitation. Just these patients, I think of the fluffy pancreas like a sponge and they just eat up fluid. And so you just have to keep up with their volume requirements, even that means intubating the patient. A thing you have to do is stop the offending agent. If it's a pill, if it's alcohol, if you have hypertriglyceridemia, because you have to apherese the triglycerides away. You do not, they used to give antibiotics in the past, but now we've moved away from that. And so unless you have evidence of infection, like air in these fluid collections, you do not treat antibiotics. Early enteral feeding has better outcomes. And then if you need to, you have this step up approach in managing them. A lot of the time, these fluid collections, the body will just handle it on its own. But if not, you can place IR drains if they're acutely septic. Um, if they're not, or they're having failure to thrive with like compression of the stomach from these uh, fluid collections, you can do endoscopic cyst gastrostomies, VARDs, or transgastric necrosectomies. In the past, they used to do open necrosectomies, but almost like the morbidity and mortality was like 80%. So we really don't do that anymore. Um, these are different surgeries that we do for chronic pancreatitis. Um, this is pretty, you know, doing a, a wiggle for a chronic pancreatitis is pretty rare. This one, I think you'll see the most, where essentially you just fillet open the, the pancreatic duct and then do a side-to-side -side anastomosis with bowel. Um, and then these are more extensive and less common surgeries that we do for chronic pancreatitis. Oftentimes, there's a lot of symptom management, like a celiac plexus block to help with the pain. So the pancreatic cyst, I used to be super confused by these. Um, and so the two questions that I ask myself, what, which really clarify things, are does it communicate with the main pancreatic duct and does it produce mucin? And if you answer these two questions, you can usually tell them all apart. And so if it creates mucin, then it's a mucinous neoplasm. And so I think of mucin and CEA as like kind of bad. Like I think of colon cancer and anything that's making mucin is usually not great. And so mucin equals high CEA. And high ECEA is usually bad. And so these are the ones that have malignant potential, right? The, the next question is, does it communicate with the duct? So the mucinous cystic neoplasms do not communicate with the duct. And you think of the pancreatic duct as making amylase. So you'll have a high CEA if it's mucinous, but a low amylase if it does not communicate with the duct. That's where your mucinous cystic neoplasm is. For high CEA and communication with the duct, you'll have um, high CEA and high amylase, which is your IPMNs. On the other side, if it's not mucin, then you have a low CEA. And if it does communicate with the duct like a pseudocyst from pancreatitis, right? We know that is draining amylase, you'll have a high amylase. Your serous cyst adenomas neither create mucin, so low CEA, and are not communicating with the duct, so they have a low amylase. And the same is true for your solid pseudopapillary neoplasms and your uh, pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So if you're able to answer these two questions, you don't really have to remember these things. You can just kind of logic through them. So these are, you know, all the different aspects of the, the pancreatic uh, neoplasm, uh, cystic neoplasms that are helpful to learn, right? A lot of them for the mucinous and the um, serous cystadenomas, they have a female predominance, whereas IPMNs are kind of equal. You know, you'll hear buzzwords like egg cell classification for the mucinous, mucinous um, cystic neoplasms and ovarian stromi for the mucinous cystic neoplasms, which helps me remember that it's more female predominant. Um, so you can look through this chart as you uh, as you need to. Um, so then you have your, for the IPMNs specifically, you'll hear, uh, you'll see more questions about these. Um, the Fuku Fukuoka guidelines are what helps us determine who gets surgery and who doesn't. But generally, the main duct IPMNs, you'll offer patient surgery for those, whereas for the branch duct IPMNs, you only do that if they have high-risk features or a lot of worrisome features. Um, so now going to pancreatic new endocrine tumors. Um, most, most commonly, they're non-functional, um, but sometimes they are. There are ways to work up and localize them, CT scans, dotatates. Dotatates rely on a somatostatin receptor, which insulinomas generally do not have. So they are, the dotatates are less helpful for insulinomas. And then you can you know, always look at the hormone levels and chromogranin A's. And then uh, EUS can help you get some more information about them. Most of these are sporadic, but they are associated with certain genetic um, syndromes like MEN and von Hippel-Lindau. 
And so each of the uh, different hormones would have different um, symptoms, right? So for you'll want to recognize these buzzwords like the glucagonoma, the dermatitis, diabetes, depression, and DVTs, right? The peptic ultra disease, um, you know, uh, uh, or gastronomas, you'll have, you know, refractory peptic ulcer disease, no, you know, no matter what they do, they still have these ulcers, uh, diarrhea and weight loss. And so what's important also to know is which tumors are going to be malignant versus benign. Insulinomas are almost always benign, whereas uh, glucagonoma, cement, statinomas, and VIPomas are almost always malignant. Um, so uh, just familiarizing yourself with these like syndromes are going to be helpful in helping you identify them. Um, this is just like a pearl, the gastronoma triangle, where just the majority of gastronomas are found. Uh, and the triangle is bordered by the porta hepatis, um, the second uh, and third portion of duodenum, and then the junction of the neck and pancreas, um, the neck and the body of the pancreas. And so most of your gastronomas will be here. And uh, last but not least, just briefly doing pancreatic cancer. It's the ninth most common cancer and the third most common cause of death. Most patients don't live past five years. And unfortunately, a lot of patients present with locally advanced or distant metastatic disease. Um, there are a number of, of uh, risk factors, but some things to be aware of um, are uh, Lynch syndrome, which is here, your genetics for MLH, MSH, MSH6, um, and then T, TP53 uh, and uh, uh, po poitz jaegers syndrome. Um, most of them are sporadic. And the genes to really know for, you know, basically all pancreatic cancers are KRAS. And then uh, P53 is also very common. And so some things you may hear to give you a clue that, it, you know, you're looking at a pancreatic cancer is obstructive jaundice. Unfortunately, patients in the body entail, they don't have that obstructive jaundice to let you know that, you know, there's a mass in the pancreas. So oftentimes they present with metastatic disease and like pain and weight loss. Some patients come, especially older patients, come with new diabetes, which can be a sign that they have a pancreatic cancer. And then there is this, these like little pearls, uh, little things that you may hear in your question stem to help you identify this is a pancreatic cancer. Um, and then you diagnose them with uh, CT scans and my uh, attendings favorite the four C's, your CA-99, CEA, CBC, and a CNP, which includes LFTs. And then you do an EGD and EUS to help um, uh, get some biologic information. Uh, you, they have TNM staging, but really one of the most important things is what their resectability is. Um, if they're, up, if they're resectable upfront, right, there's no vascular involvement, you get upfront surgery, then usually chemotherapy afterwards. And these surgeries may include a Whipple or distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, depending on where it is. The patients who are borderline resectable, there is some vascular involvement, but not something that precludes them from surgery. So they generally get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That's you know something that's been newer in the past 10, 10 or so years. And the, the chemotherapies that you'll see most commonly are fulfirinox and gemabraxane, which uh, in recent trials have showed they are equivalent. Gemabraxane tends to be a little bit more easy for older patients to tolerate. And last but not least, you have your locally advanced, right, where they're basically, we don't like to say unresectable anymore, because sometimes you can treat them pre, you know, in a neoadjuvant setting to try to get them to resectability, but oftentimes they are not. So sometimes they get chemotherapy or radiation. And so, you know, there are certain terms that you're here that help you clue into what is resectable versus borderline versus locally advanced, right? And it's the uh, vascular involvement. For the veins, usually that's borderline resectable because we can do portal vein reconstructions. It's when the arteries are involved that they start getting into the locally advanced. So you don't want any SMA encasement. You don't want a hepatic artery encasement because patients can't survive without those. And so those are generally considered locally advanced. So I have a couple practice questions if I have time. Um, if I don't, we can leave those for later. Yeah, I think, um, thank you so much, Huda. I think just for the sake of time, we'll just give a, a second for anyone to um, ask any questions in the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting for that, um, if we did have a sort of a, a question from the uh, foregut presentation from IO. Um, so if Shabi, if you don't mind answering this one, the question is, um, can you please go over the x-ray findings for a slippage of a lap band? Yeah, um, it might be easier for me to share my screen just really quickly. Um, 
it'll make a little bit more sense. So let me know when you can see my screen. We got it? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so if you look here, right, see this band that you can kind of see on this x-ray? I'm not able to make this image a lot bigger without making everything messy. But do you see how the angle that it's at is greater than like 45 degrees? So ideally the band should be pointing toward the patient's left shoulder. You want it at like a 45, maybe less than 60 degree angle. This has clearly moved beyond, um, you know, like that 45 degree angle has slid down. Uh, I'm gonna try to find, uh, you can kind of see it in this image as well, where it's more of that 90 degree angle rather than that 45 or 60 degree angle. And that's kind of what you're gonna see um, when you're considering about, you know, has the band slipped or in the ED, you get that x-ray. The thing to do for that, first of all, you take air uh, or saline out of that port, you know, you take that out and then you would go in and take the band out. Um, and that would be your treatment. Did that kind of help? Um, it's just, you know, on Radiopedia. <laughs> Thank you. That I think that was great. All right. Um, I think we will move to um, Dr. Tom Mao. And then, of course, if anyone comes up with any questions in the meantime, feel free to put in the Q&A as well. Um, so next, we'll go over trauma and critical care with Dr. Tom Mao. He is um, one of the surgical residents at UCSD in California. Um, so take it away, Tom. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, okay. All right. Everyone can see this, right? Great. All right. So again, we also have a lot of slides to cover. I'm going to try and blaze through a lot of this. Um, but definitely stop me if there's so, any issues. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go through some general apps I tips I've found that helpful over the years. Um, first of all, let's just stick to the conventional teaching. A lot of us are at institutions where we do things that are not necessarily um, the tried and true. Some of us try to push down the low. Now it's probably not the time to break out the robotic Whipple in the trauma case. Um, objective data, they will rarely, when they provide you with these uh, uh, objective data such as blood pressure, heart rates, they do not make it very subtle. It's not one of those where you have a quasi-stable patient, you're going back and forth, is it stable or not? It's They will make it clear to you. Patient's hypotensive will be 90s or 40s, 80s or 40s. Now, the images they show, they won't be little subtle things. You're not expected to be a radiologist. So don't try to spend too much time trying to find the little details and that is distinguish these cases. And then other things, remember some of the key points, especially for trauma and critical care, there are some key points that will tell you, um, really uh, clue you in towards what to do next. And so remember those numbers. And so for example, if you're hypotensive, those are kind of your unstable and clue that you need to be in the operating room. Your chest tube output will be clued in whether you need to go for thoracotomies, et cetera. And of course, just general, for uh, almost all standardized questions these days, read the last sentence of the question. They'll give you a long question stem, but in the in the end, if you read the last sentence first, then you read the four uh, the choices, you probably can skip about fifty percent of the question stem and still get to the right answer. So just save some time if uh, your find time is an issue for you on these tests. So outline for again, we have a whole lot to go through for trauma and then critical care. We'll just cover some of the key things for critical care. Can't cover everything, unfortunately. Um, for starting with trauma, the neuro part, neuro trauma isn't as heavily tested. Again, for just remember your ATLS, ABCDEs, and then your secondaries. But really, the one thing they love to test is the GCS. And uh, I would say the GCS probably you is a 50 50. You will get one question where they'll test you, ask you to calculate the GCS. I think for people, even, you know, the acronym I always go by is EVM. If you're doing this in the trauma, you're uh, giving everyone GCS. The hardest one I think for everyone that trips up everyone, both in practice and also in real life is uh, the motor. The motor one is uh, if you have to think that, well, for one it's easy, six is easy. The heart, the heart part that kind of gets people is between five and four. So withdraw when you squeeze someone's hand or uh, squeeze someone's fingertip and they withdraw back, then that's a four versus, or if they just kind of generally move, then that's more of a four. But if they localize this, then they'll really just pull that arm away from you and not move every, everything else. Um, the flexion, the extension, think of it as a decorticate and decerbid. 
I, I, you just, I just move my arms and I go decorticate, deserve it. And that's kind of how I remember it. But there will be, if not this year, next year, or the year after, there will be one test question in that QBank of uh, test questions that will ask you to calculate the GCS. So just make sure you remember that. Uh, for, again, your different kinds of uh, neurotraumas, the epidural, subdural, uh, subarachnoids, um, they're not subtle. They'll give you these very obvious findings. So commit these images to uh, in memory if you haven't seen enough of these. I think a lot of us at trauma centers, unfortunately, see mostly blunt trauma. So um, just remember for epidurals, they don't cross suture line. That's your keyword. And for uh, subarachnoids, it's more associated with uh, aneurysmal bleeds than uh, the others. Uh, so for management principles, you got to maintain cerebral per, uh, perfusion pressure, CPP. They don't get into this too much, but just know that, remember, CPP is MAP minus ICP, and your target goal is 60. Some places, some places will say 50, but 60 is kind of a safe number to aim for if they ask you that. And again, if you want to increase your CPP, you can either give pressures or fluids to get your MAP up, and then you can decrease ICP. So remember the Kelly Marone Doctrine. You have a fixed space in your skull, so you, if I uh, you don't you gotta if you have blood in there, then you gotta evacuate IC, uh, the other fluid inside your brain to uh, get you that decrease in ICP. So most likely, either do an EVD, the uh, drain out your CSF, you decrease the brain metabolic demand, so decrease the amount of blood flow to the brain, so hyperventilate, sedate, par paralyze them, and then or if you really need the space, do a crani to give you more space. And then uh, of all the studies, of course, everything that we've seen is that the hypotension is the worst thing for TBI patients. So if they gave a question asking about what are the one thing that you can do to prevent bad outcomes for these patients is avoid hypotension. Everything else, there's no good evidence for. And again, this is just a graph to remind everyone how, why you, the reason why we want to maintain that CPP in that 60 range is the auto regulation that's in the uh, <clears throat> cerebral vasculature that's a little different than anywhere else in the body. So again, neurotrauma, so the spine trauma, I think is also one of those uh, meh. We see a lot of them, probably not as well tested. Again, you just wanna make sure you know your neurological deficits and stabilize the spine and augment the map if you're concerned for spinal cord injury. The big thing is that they might bring up a term called spinal shock, which is often confusing for people because it's not actually shock in a sense. It's not um, neurogenic shock, not to be confused with neurogenic shock. Spinal shock is more if you think of your spinal cord got, cord got really stunned and so you have classic paralysis and loss of bowel and bladder control and sensation, but you're not really knocking out your sympathetics. You're not really actually in shock. Whereas in neurogenic shock, you uh, transect your sympathetic chain, usually T6 or above. So, and then you get hypotension and also bradycardia. The fracture patterns, I would say, if you want to pick a few of those and remember it, maybe the Jefferson and the Heyman's, um, just to know and just remember the location and uh, compression fracture, so you can at least see on the CT scan. But for the most part, they don't get into too much details about fracture terminology for the most part. Uh, moving on to neck trauma, then this gets a little bit more tested. Um, every once in a while, you'll hear zone two, zone one, zone three. Um, so just remember your zone uh, borders. So the clavicle, or sorry, the uh, cricoid cartilage, and then the angle of the mandible are your two lines. And then so between that, below that is your zone one, above that is the zone two, and then above the angle of the mandibles are zone three. And that really then changes, um, comes into a, a play when you talk about um, what to do with these penetrating neck traumas to the different zones. Because, um, and again, when they say penetrating neck trauma, the definition is that it has to violate the platysma. If your question says there's no violation of the platysma, you're done. Um, you don't need to explore. But as you can see, there's a whole fancy algorithms. And I know out there, there's the push for the no zone approach to neck trauma, but still just stick, know your zone one, two, and three, then that for the most part, if you have hard signs of, uh, so instability, blood squirting on the blood, air bubbling out, you're going to the OR. If you don't have any of those and you still suspect, then you probably start with the CTA and then think about the other uh, workup as well as the bronchoscopy potentially, as well as uh, uh, EGD and uh, swallow study. So, the hard signs, again, just remember those. You don't need to remember everyone. Again, a lot of these are self are pretty uh, self-explanatory ones we have seen already. Um, but just know that if you see the hard signs, you got to go for next exploration. And the next exploration part is don't forget that you're looking for all through all of your hollow viscous, uh, all your tubes, right? So in your neck, got to remember that you have to assess both the airway 
and also the esophagus in addition to the blood vessel. So whether that was esophagram or EGD or laryngoscopy or trea, bronchoscopy as well as the angiogram. So just don't, I think probably the one thing people forget the most is to look at the esophagus, but they get excited with, oh, blood squirting out, let's look at the arteries and then forget about the fact that the esophagus is right there and will likely also get injured as well. And so for esophagus, um, the esophageal injuries, they're not as common, but uh, when they do happen, it's quite stressful. If they're contained, so you don't really have any, the test question will say it's rel relatively clean, you see a small hole, um, then you can just observe it. If, uh, or sorry, if it's contained, you don't see any holes and there's not, there's no suckers or anything, then you'll just, you can say, I can observe it. Most likely it'll say is that you'll have a small hole is there's no, not a lot of dirt or any other um, uh, gastric material in there, then that's when you just place a drain and then repair it with, in two layers. And of course, if uh, it's extensive gunk and just shattered esophagus, you drain it, you leave a bunch of drains and call it a day. Uh, for the trachea and larynx, uh, uh, laryngeal injuries is uh, the key things to remember is that you put a trachea in. And then you can also, you should probably bronch as well to rule out a bronchial injury. And for vascular, if it's a vertebral artery, you can probably embolize and ligate as well as the jugular vein. If it's the carotid, you want to repair it. And uh, just remember that if you're really stuck and they don't give you the option to repair, you can also ligate and know that you're going to have a 20% stroke risk. Um, probably could also patch, into, uh, patch repair if it's a big hole, but I... They won't get into that much details on this test. And then for thyroid, do not resect the thyroid. Do not do a thyroid trauma, uh, trauma thyroidectomy. You should drain it, and that's about the most you should do. So a blonde neck trauma, probably we see again, we see more of this, uh, but it's tested less. It's BCVI, and your diagnosis uh, is a CTA. And just remember all the things that you get. Um, skull base fractures, C-spine fractures, all those things that would uh, focal neurological deficits, go get a CTA. And really the treatment is not exciting, which is why it's not often tested. It's just antiplatelet therapy, maybe dual antiplatelet therapy at tops, and rarely do you need to go for endovascular intervention. So then moving on to uh, penetrating uh, chest trauma is, um, if you think about this, is the box, right, which is the border by your clavicle, your midclavicular line, and the costal margins. All your big, important structures, your heart, your great vessels, your trachea, your lungs, they're all in that box. And so penetrating chest trauma, high index, high index of suspicion for all these things, it being injured. And so if, again, easy thing about trauma, if they gave you the unstable patient, 90s over 40s, 80s over 40s, tachycardic, not able to maintain their airway intubated, you're going to the OR. You're doing sternotomy. And that makes the, that, that makes the question rel relatively straightforward. If it's stable, then they'll try and get tricky on you and try to ask you, what do you want to do? Do you want to observe it? And then really, it's you need to do further workup. Make sure that, again, you don't forget about the esophagus that's behind there. Everyone think about doing the fast, doing the CTA, and maybe the bronch to look at the airway, but then forget about the esophagus back there. You need to do a barrier swallow to look at it. And uh, they'll say, well, if you don't do it with a single contrast, start with a gastrograph and it doesn't work, then bury them to really prove you don't have esophageal injury. And also the pericardial window and sternotomy, that can be a little bit debatable in the trauma world. But again, the safe answer is pericardial window. If it pauses, then you're doing sternotomy for blood. Um, the thoracodominal penetrating trauma, the thoracodominal region is sort of uh, below the clavicles, outside the box, but uh, sort of your lateral flanking involves some of your left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant. And so really what they're trying to get you to think about is uh, it may look like it's in the thorax, but it's going to potentially penetrate the diaphragm and get your uh, uh, intra-abdominal intestine uh, organs that are also injured. And so if it's stable, you really should explore these wounds and most likely take them for laparotomy or diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, diagnostic laparoscopy is a safe answer for these kind of uh, penetrating wounds in uh, on a test, on the test. Um, and it's a fairly common thing to do. And obviously, if it's not stable, again, go to the heart. Uh, for diaphragmatic hernias, just remember that you repair these with permanent sutures. And uh, if they give you the option just repair with uh, permanent sutures, then just take it. Unless they say it's a huge hole, then you can't fix it, then you can leave a mesh. But most of the time, you can't get away without leaving the mesh. And if you're really not able to expose the right side, you can leave it alone since the liver just sort of fills up that space. Although I will say I have seen uh, kidneys herniate out there and cause the AKI, uh, CKD from that. Um, so for hemothorax and pneumothorax, it's one of those things we see the most, right? So this one, you got a massive white owl on the left side, 
um, with a low of shift and on towards the right side. So that's clue you in that that's a hemothorax. And then you can see this right side, the, the left side, the lung is down, you know, pneumothorax. Both of these patients need a chest tube. And uh, chest tube, just remember your fourth, fifth, the buzzwords, fourth, fifth, rib space, mid axial line, et cetera. Um, if there is a persistent air leak, they might uh, try to clue you in on that, then suspect a bronchial injury. And then for OR indication, this is one of those hard numbers that I talk about on the test. In real life, you probably... It's not as uh, clear cut as this, but in real life, but in, on test, if it's 1.5 liters or over 200 per four, 200 or four hours, you probably don't even remember the need to remember the four hours. Just remember 200 or five, 1,500. Those are two numbers. Then you need to take them to the OR. The other part of this is uh, to think about um, routine hemothorax. That is very commonly tested is that if you have routine hemothorax, they'll say the patient's not getting better in three or four days. They'll give you the option of IR pigtail, put another chest tube, all these fancy things, TPA. The right answer is VATS. Don't do any of those above. Don't pass go. Just go take them to the R, do a VATS and clean them out. That's the best way to get them to uh, recover. Um, rear fractures, uh, very deadly for the old elderly. Falls, motor vehicle accidents are the most common ones. And uh, you get associated pulmonary contusion as well as hemoneumos. And for elderly, they die of... Uh, pneumonia due to them splinting and not able to keep their alveoli open. So remember to treat with multimodal pain control and aggressive pulmonary rehab. And they'll try and trigger you and they say, well, we can really, the patients are in a lot of the pain, we can try and sedate them. That is the wrong answer. That's the one thing you should not do. So uh, analgesia, not sedation is the answer. And then uh, flow chest, remember it's, uh, the definition is uh, three uh, ribs with uh, two uh, different areas of uh, fracture. So you can see on this top right corner here, top right corner, uh, this is, you have two uh, breakage and two points and then three ribs. And that also causes respiratory uh, failure. And in those cases, you got to take them for a rib plating. I think we're doing more and more of these days. So hopefully everyone's going to be able to see more of these in their uh, clinical practice as well. Uh, blood con blunt cardiac trauma for the most part um, is uh, sternal fractures. You get a uh, cardiac contusion, and then gives you arrhythmia. So your workup is EKG and your as well as a fast. And if it's a positive, then you should try to consider a pericardial window. And if it's positive for blood, then you're going for stenotomy. But for the most part, uh, the answer is usually supportive care, telemetry, and observation, and it should be okay. Uh, the aortic and great vessel injuries, um, if they're really bad, they're not going to make it here. But the classic picture they'll show you is this widened uh, aortic notch over here, the widened mediastinum that gets everyone scared. And uh, most of the time, it's the acceleration, deceleration, uh, deceleration injury. And just remember the keyword, ligamentum arteriosum. That's where it tends to tear. And then the diaphragmatic aor uh, hiatus and the aortic roots is also other areas that they could tear. But usually, uh, they ask it's going to be ligamentum arteriosum. And then if you are stable, then you're getting a CTA, obviously, and the endovascular treatment in this case is preferred. So you, they might offer you open and endovascular in, the, in, in a stable patient, pick the endovascular option. For penetrating, if they usually, again, they'll exsang exsanguinate before they get to you, but if they don't miraculously exsanguinate, then you're taking them for a thoracotomy or um, at the minimum to fix it. Um probably would not endovascular fix it until, uh, and so open is usually the safe answer for this. So operating exposure for chest trauma is something that is a fair game on the test. And so this is my uh, poorly drawn picture over here, part of the terrible artwork. But so for the right thoracotomy, right and anterior lateral thoracotomy is the one that'll get you your right main stem bronchus as well as your proximal left main stem bronchus. That's a little counterintuitive. People think, oh, left side, left bronchus, left, Thoracotomy, no. Uh, your proximal left bronchus will get better. You'll get back better exposure with the right anterior lateral thoracotomy. You'll get it, you get also be able to reach the trachea that way and also your upper two thirds esophagus. Whereas your sternomy really gets your heart, your ascending aorta, your great vessels, as well as your approximate right subclavian, which makes sense if you think about the, where your subclavian is. Um, and then your left anterior lateral gets your descending aorta, obviously, and then the esophagus as a uh, lower one third of it, as well as the left subclavia. Uh, and rarely that might come up is that clavicular resection. What do you do it for? And really, you're reserving that if you can't reach the uh, subclavian vein or artery distally. And so you, 
high, I highly doubt this will be a choice on a question, but it might come up in this fair game. So then moving on to abdominal trauma, the guts and glories that everyone loves and we're in general surgery. So I'll cover, I'll go run through some of this stuff a little bit less. I mean, I think everyone hopefully have seen the blunt trauma step and penetrating trauma algorithms, but basically if they're unstable, you're going to the OR. If they're stable, if this blunt, you're getting a CT scan fast and then CT scan. And then if you're, uh, is uh, penetrating, you're doing wound exploration. And so making sure that you're able to visualize fascia. That's really the key word, fascial penetration. If you're not sure they're not giving to you, you could do, do DPL or diagnostic laparoscopy. Both are fair and uh, equally acceptable answer on the test. And then um, if it's positive, obviously you're converted to a laparotomy. Uh, damage control laparotomy, remember those that concept in trauma is uh, when they're in the extremist, just think about what is the minimally necessary thing I need to do to keep this patient alive and live to fight another day. As long as you can keep on keep that in mind, then I think uh, it makes sense in terms of what to do. So you control the bleeding, put packing, you ligate whatever veins that you can sacrifice, and then you either shunt or repair the arteries if you can do it really quickly. You control contamination, so resect the dead bowel, close holes, close enterotomies, make sure poop isn't leaking to the belly, and then you put drains in the hepatobiliary system things that you don't want to mess with, like the pancreas, just put drains in and you know, call it a day and bring them back to the ICU for further resuscitation. So liver trauma, you probably won't get tested on a WASD grading as far as they'll tell you which WASD grade, uh, they might tell you which grade it is, but then the context they'll tell you whether the patient's stable and if it's stable, then you observe it. If they're transient uh, responsive to blood and fluids, then you take them to IR usually for angioembolization. And if they're unstable, you go to the R for damage control. And so for liver trauma, there's a couple of ways. There are a whole bunch of different things that could get injured. But for the most part, point one lacerations or injuries, you just suture repair, pack it, argon beam. You know, you can also do a hepatect, uh, partial hepatectomy for that area as well. Um, for the artery, if it's the common hepatic, you can actually ligate it and then they'll re, uh, reperfuse back, uh, backwards from the GDA. And then for... Uh, the retrohepatic IVC, this is the shrock shunt. This is the atrial cable shunt that it, the heroic one thing that everyone hopes to see one that is like, successful, but most of the time it's not. And then, of course, if it's a gallbladder gall injury, just take it out. Uh, for pancreatic trauma, this one is a little bit different. So this one, the WS degrading, they'll go through all this. and uh, But the one thing to remember is grade three. So grade three is the one that if you have a grade three, this is the distal transaction uh, transaction involving the duct. This is the one that you, aside from grade three, everything else, you just leave drains. And uh, if it's proximal, you can add a ERCP to try and stint it and come back and live to fight another day. But grade three is the one where you do a distal pancreatectomy. This is the, I would probably say the high yield one in terms of grading for all your abdominal traumas. And then of course, you delay reconstruction when you can, uh, drain it widely as much as you can and uh, support a care. If trauma Whipple is on the answer, please don't take, pick it. I know it's tempting, I, but it's not. It's never the right answer. Um, for splenic trauma, splenes again live to uh, exist only to give causes pain. And for these, if they're stable, similar idea. Observe they're transient and stable, you take them to IR, and they're unstable, you take it out. Um, really tr the big thing for spleen that's a little bit different is you got to watch out for the splenic artery still aneurysm. They'll say that patient is initially stable on the floor and then suddenly bleeds in three or four days. What do you do? You take them to the IR, resuscitate them, con concern for pseudo aneurysm. So make sure you get a CTA for short term and then try not to do a splenography that re really works. And then re remember also that they need to get their splenic vaccines beforehand. They finish. Uh, do a deal trauma. No fun, cause a lot of uh, anxieties for everyone. So you get this giant hematoma on this over here and usually diagnosed with CT if you're not in the OR looking at the duo. Um, get an upper GI if you're concerned per leak. And if there's a hematoma rather than OR and it's greater than two centimeters, in general, as a side note, if a hematoma is greater than two centimeters, that's the indication clue in that you might need to explore it. Um, it can cause SPOs, which you treat uh, conservatively. It will self-resolve. And then you basically need to breathe and repair as much as possible if you're in OR and you're staring at a hole. Um, if this, if you're looking at the second portion of the duo where you can't really resect anything and do a primary anastomosis, then um, that's when you kind of drain widely and then do a uh, 
pyloric exclusion or the gastrojejunosinine to divert things away from that area and let it heal. Uh, the big mor mor morbidity from this, uh, the dual injury is your fistulas. Uh, the small and large bowel trauma, this is one I'll blaze through just because I think this is the part where we deal the most with as general surgery residents. If it's less than 50%, you repair it. If it's more than 50% hold, you resect it. Um, and then remember when you resect it, they'll ask you which how you close the hole. It's always transversely to avoid uh, stricturing the small intestine. Of course, if you have a hematoma greater than two centimeters, you're exploring that. Um, proximal colon, resect, re uh, repair the hole, and then don't divert. Uh, left colon, you really need to divert. And then for rectum is the one where you actually do divert. And the big thing is that if it's an intraperitoneal, you can repair the defect. If it's extraperitoneal, uh, you probably can't reach and repair it. Then you just divert and then do not drain the extraperitoneal. Do not go wash out and drain presacral, place presacral drains. That's one that they'll try and get you on. As far as the retroperitoneal hematomas by zone, this is tested each year. Remember your zone one, zone two, zone three. Just think about what's behind um, each one and why you actually have to go explore them. And then I think a lot of this makes sense. So penetrating injuries, you're almost always exploring all the hematomas. Whereas for blunt injuries, you don't want to explore the hematomas in the pelvis because unless it's expanding and pulse tile in your face, because there are a lot of sacral veins in there. And if you get in there and you unroof the hematoma, you just remove the body's natural way of uh, tamponading. And now you're in a world of hurt. Uh, remember your two operative exposures for the retroperitoneum, the cotelp rash, which is a right side of this medial visceral evisceration. So it kind of is a coker plus you eviscerate, you move, you mobilize the right colon, then you do coker. So you, uh, you, uh, you reveal your right kidney as well as your right IBC and your, that's how you get to the IBC. Then the maddox is how you get to the aorta. And then you, for this one, unlike the cotelp rash, the maddox, you take the kidney with you as you flip everything out. And then moving on to pelvic trauma, this is one everyone looks at this and then you you know what's coming next. The question stem is going to say, your patient is hypotensive, what do you do? Resuscitate, blood, pelvic binder, control it, and then take them to injury if you stabilize them. Otherwise, take them to for preperitoneal packing if they're unstable. And so for this one, make sure it's, the answer is space of rhesus. So you make that incision. You don't do a laparotomy incision because you don't want to get into the peritoneum. If you do, then you lose that area of potential avenue for uh, preperitoneal packing. And of course, fixate. Um, when you have pelvic uh, trauma, they might try to lead you astray. And then it actually manifests as a bladder injury that they try to hide in there in the question stem. So just remember, they're associated with hollow viscous injuries when you have these pelvic fractures. Um, for genital urinary uh, tracts, uh, just remember kidney, ureter, bladder, urethra, these are all could get injured. They all have different uh, diagnostic imaging. I think imaging diagnostic choice is probably the most tested one. So remember for your kidneys, the CT with IV contrast, ureter, then you move to IV, IV pilogram or retrograde pilogram. For the bladder, it's a CT cystogram where it's, you just shoot contrast in the bladder from a foley. And then retrograde urethrogram, you shoot contrast through the urethra. Self-explanatory, but it, it, it trips people up each year. And of course, the common cause of trauma, as you can imagine, for kidneys, blunt, Ureter, we won't go into every one of these, but they always have hematuria. Usually you have to just uh, can observe the kidney injuries, but then you have to repair the intraperitoneal bladder, the ureters, um, and then urethra. The ureters one, just remember, don't be a hero. If it's a big oh, big hole, put a uh, PCN in there and then just uh, tie off the distally and then tie off the, sorry, tie off the ureter, put a PCN, drain, divert, and then reconstruct later on, especially the patients in extremis. They also say that you can do primary anastomosis over the, um, for the upper two-thirds of the ureter, but that's about it. And then, of course, remember, you put drains and you put foleys. Uh, extremity injuries, and so just remember that for um, the big thing that they want you to watch out for is vascular injury associated. So for knee dislocations, pelvic artery injury is the big one. And again, uh, heart signs are compromised, so vascular injury, you go into the OR. If your gets your ABI, so it's less than 0.9, that's the indication for CT angium. And then if you're doing saphenous main graft for two uh, semi-year injuries, make sure you use the contralateral limb. That's also will come up on the oral boards incidentally. And then make sure you shunt if you need to, and then you can repair it, then you can uh, formally fix the fix it once ortho does their stuff. And then just remember your uh, compartment, traumatic compartment syndrome. All right. And uh, we're wrapping up.
Sorry, running a little bit low on time over here, so we'll just miss. But uh, just for compartment syndrome, I will say the question stem is uh, posterior deep compartment is the one that you're going to miss the most. And don't forget your form is also susceptible to compartment syndrome. Trauma and pregnancy, save the mother, Rogam, and the Clier uh, Becky test. I think uh, that's pretty straightforward. So moving on to critical care, we'll just go through just uh, this is this will be available just the common uh, uh, equations to calculate your cardiac output. And uh, remember that hemoglobin is the most important part of your uh, uh, O2 delivery. And then for every single time, just remember that if you have increased O2 demand, you're going to have increased acid, increased CO2, increased metabolic component, and then that will shift everything rightward. So just remember one side, and then that'll, for some reason, they love testing this. Uh, for shock, I would say the big thing is remember the numbers. You can logic through every single one of these shock uh, uh, components in terms of Merrill. So don't try to memorize this table, but remember the numbers because they'll give you numbers and they'll, they won't tell you whether it's normal or abnormal. And so for you to decide, and then if you know the numbers are abnormal, then you know which one, which type of shock it is. And then again, pressors is a relatively low yield, I would say for this test, but you do need to know it uh, in terms of your uh, pressor choices for different things. And lastly, for ventilators, I would say, remember that for ventilators, common things been common is you provide the set volume and a set uh, rate, or sorry, set volume or set pressure. One or the other, you could provide both, and then they get that the uh, weather common health, uh, no matter what. And then you can have a peep to uh, prevent avular de uh, recruitment. And then you want to make sure you minimize FiO2 to reduce oxidative damage. And then you set your respiratory rate now to blow out the excess CO2. And so, of course, remember, avoid your high plateau pressures. Rebel EM has a great chart over here that kind of goes through the different vent uh, settings. So I highly recommend you take a look at that before the test if you're uh, rusty on vents. And then for ARDS, every time there's an ARDS question about Berlin criteria, this give you this chest X-ray. Remember, number one, source control. Then you want to make sure you keep your tile volumes at four to six uh, milliliters per ki uh, kilogram of the predicted body weight, not your actual body weight. So remember that part. And then the rest is just make sure you keep your peeps uh, permissive hypercapnia, paralysis prone, ECMO, things that we hopefully have all seen at this point. And sorry, I ran a little bit over time, but um, have you taken any questions? Thanks so much, Tom. I know this is a lot of content for each topic to fit into just 30 minutes. So Again, I just want to reiterate that um, this will all of these slides and the recordings um, will be um, will be available after the webinar. Um, so just wanted to give a plug for SSAT at the end. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning, but my name is Rachel Kim. I'm a resident at Indiana University. I'm on the resident Ed uh, fellows education committee on SSAT. Highly uh, recommend everyone join a uh, candidate membership, which means a trainee re membership for residents and fellows is only $20 annually. The SSAT webinar series, including the resident education resident fellows education committee webinars are all on this website on the SSAT.com slash webinar. And that is where the slides will be available. Um, this kind of confused me in previous years, but you actually have to click on sort of the webinar and the name, and that will give you the link to download the slides. Not it's not um all it's not always obvious. And then the recording, Bev, I think we put this on our YouTube channel usually. Is that right? Um, and that should be linked on the website as well. And then our SSA team annual meeting is coming up in May. Um, and we if we see you there, we we would love to see everyone there. Um, it is in conjunction with DDW Digestive Diseases Week, so it's always a fun time, and it's in Washington, D.C., which is coincidentally my hometown or near my hometown, so I'm excited this year. Um, so if anyone has some last questions in the chat um, or on the Q&A, um, feel free to put them in. Um, thank you again to our presenters for giving really excellent presentations and fitting a lot of high yield stuff into a really small amount of time. So thank you again for your time and your effort and, and all the work you put into this. Um, and so with that, unless anyone has any questions, I don't want to keep anyone too late. So um, thank you guys again. <laughs>